So today what we're going to do, so um, in the scenario, you guys have processed your data and now you have a um, XDS HKL file and you're going to want to take it on and do something with it. And so this is sort of like a little bit of extra um, information on data processing, getting, basically getting your data ready so you can do things like molecular replacement or what we're going to actually do in the next step, which is going to be analyzing that data um, and determining everything you can know about it before you actually start um, structure solution. So um, the, the programs I'll be using today are all part of the CCP4 suite. Uh, there's a link uh, in the classroom with, whoops, with software and on the software list, um, we have the CCP4 and I did go in and add a link to where you could get ADXB to look at your images if you want to do that. Um, so in this, I am over here at the CCP4 website and they have tabs and one of them is documentation. Now CCP4 comes, um, you can use the programs like on the command line and I will use some of them on the command line. They also have two graphical user interfaces. Um, there's what the, the old one, it's called CCP4i and you launch it from your browser by typing CCP4. I like this and hitting return and it's gonna bring you up um into an interface this like orange bar that looks like this there is a newer version called ccp4 i2 and they basically redid it to make it look more spiffy because this looks like it was written in the 90s and it probably was uh but like if you use cc4 i2 we'll see if it runs uh it kept uh i kept throwing segmentation faults and would crash. Apparently it doesn't like my Mac. I'll just show you, I'm not gonna use it today, but I'm just gonna show you all what it looks like. And just sort of some of the organization of it, mostly because we don't need to see the same thing uh, a gazillion times on different interfaces. So this is the CCP4 i2 you can see it looks um much nicer and i really think that they st started this because um phoenix also has an interface and it looks more like this so you know it's got prettier graphics and things like that um and what they have in this is they have the programs are over here they're sorted by tasks and so like the tasks that we're going to use we're going to use pointless a program pointless that so they put the name what so you can do with the program and then they put the name of the program in parentheses um but i'm not gonna they they still offer the ccp4 on the old like school interface and i'm gonna actually use that one because it's a little bit um more familiar with it and uh it doesn't segmentation fault on my mac so i'm just gonna quit this Okay, so um, in CCP4, they have, they also have everything in ugly form divided into tasks, as well as what is like a catch all generic program list that has everything in it. All of these pro, so what the CCP4I interface does is that it helps, it basically writes the script files that you could use to run the jobs. It sort of, uh, it makes, it'll make series of scripts. So it streamlines everything. It makes it a little bit easier and you can just fill in boxes and point and click. Uh, the first program that I want to do is called Pointless. So what Pointless is, is it is a program to, um, it does a lot of things. It's a very, very powerful program written by Phil Evans. It can re-index your data. It can combine data sets. It can determine the true space group of your data. And it's fully documented here in the CCP4 
website. So they have a list here of, I like how I went forward and then, okay. So this is like all the program documentation. They have the name of the program, as you can see here, and then you can click it. Pointless is down here. And it will tell you the name of the program, uh, the command line command for it, which is right here. And then all of these programs in the CCP4 suite, they have a command line. And then often they have what's called keywords down here. So, so right down here in the bold, they don't, it's not case sensitive but they have keywords that you can add to the script file that lets you do certain actions. And it's all documented in here. And it's, pointless is probably what um, outside of phasing, like with um, phaser, one of the most powerful programs out there right now. So what you used to have to do is you would have to, um, try to determine your systematic absences um, during scaling. You know, if you're not sure, like when David showed you in XDS uh, that the estimate by XDS is the correct space group, pointless is where you would determine whether it is correct or not. And at AnyCAT, we always run pointless after XDS to make sure that we have the correct space group assigned. So, in this, let me see, I wrote up a bunch of scripts. So uh, pointless at its most basic looks like this, or actually let me put it up in a, editor. So I can highlight sections of it and it's easier. So there's not a lot to pointless at its most basic. Um, you on this first line right here, I have the name of the command pointless. Uh, HKL out is the keyword for the file that you want it to write out when it's done doing its job. Uh, I am then piping this to a log file so I can save um, the messages that it outputs and then I want to give it some keywords, tell it what to do. And so what I'm doing is I'm sending it, I'm saying you're going to read everything that's from this end of file to where until you find this EOF end of file. So that's what the two double arrows is, is I'm telling it to read everything after this until it gets to an EOF. Then I'm going to give it an XDS file. So I say XDS in and the name of the file. If you have a SCA file, you can use pointless and you just say SCA, S-C-A in, in the name of the file. And then um, if you have an MTZ, like you have processed your data out of MOS film, then you can just say M uh, HKLN and give it the name of the file. And then truthfully, pointless is smart enough. So even if you use the wrong like XDS SCA or HKLN and you just give it a file, it will figure it out but I have it in here like this. And this is where um, if you have multiple files that you wanna combine, you would just put them on separate lines in here. So if I had four or five uh, data files that I wanted to combine here, I would just have XDS in and then XDS in, you know, the next name of the file, et cetera, et cetera, you know, ending in HKL like right here, I'm not writing it in. And then there are a lot of keywords that let you do other things here. And one of them is the ability to exclude what, uh, images that are bad. So right here, so there are two ways to do this. Um, I have actually set it up in two, I, so you could, read multiple files in, I could go back in and reprocess uh, the data in um, two different like wedges. Uh, so like I could process from 
one to four, I think Dave was saying, I think I did it to 460. And then, so this is, what did I do? So if you look right here, I processed two wedges, XDS ASCII 1 to 460.hkl. I just renamed them after I processed them, and XDS ASCII 570 to 600. And so right here, I could actually, I'll, I'll do it actually like this two different ways, where in this one, I have the full data set. This is the same one that David processed last week for um, in the, not last week, sorry, Monday. Uh, when he was showing you how to use XDS. And then we don't like the images between uh, 461 and 570. So I'm going to exclude them. And it's going to make me a uh, MTZ file where those images are missing. So if I like leave this, let's see, I am going to, so I'm going to save it. So if in here, I, so on the command line, I have this file and I'm in Linux, which means that um, it needs to have the ability to be an executable, which I already made this an executable. So if you look at this, you can see that it has the X uh, on all three groups for this so that we can run it as an executable. And I can just, run it and it will give you a log file. So the log file is right here. And I had this right here. Actually, I, I was running it earlier to test it out. So if I wanna look at the log file, there's lots. So here is this log file and it has um, the command line arguments that I gave it. So I told it that I wanted to write this out, HKL out as this name. Um, between the EOFs, it reads in these two commands, the, the name of the file that it's reading in, and that it's gonna exclude these frames right here. This is the header right here from the XDS HKL file. So you can go back and look and see. So it says I have a data range of one to 600. Um, this right here is where it was processed before. And it has lots of information here about how it transformed the XDS axis at the CCP4. Um, these are not, uh, I wanna say the, things that you need to check, but the log file provides a lot of information for you. So like right here, you can see that it read in the first uh, data file, it's calling it run number one, and it consists of batches one to 460, 462 to 569, 571 to 600. So you can see that it, this right here from 461, to 570 I don't want, and it split it up into this batch right here to, in preparation for excluding it. It checks your resolution um, and it's gonna determine what's the best resolution for determining your space group. It's, it tests things like twinning, um, because, of course, if you have twin data, then the uh, apparent space group may be wrong. So it checks all these things. And I'm just going to skip on ahead here down to the lattice point. Group. So it, get, it reads it in. So it's, it's testing for systematic absences up here. And unfortunately, this is not a great example because this one is in um, P2 point group. And so there's not a lot of screw axes to check, uh, right here. It tests your symmetry. 
and it basically ranks what it tests here by most likely. So it says that uh, in in choice number one, it's most it's eighty five percent like it, and in choice number two, it's fifty five percent like it. On uh, the second one, it's checking it on the twofold around K. So you can see that it gives you an operator of how it would change it in case it thinks it's wrong. Um, we're not wrong, but it's testing the other possible um, space groups. It goes through all this. It does the test. So here's um, so number two. Um, and that one, it's actually the first one is P2. And then this is actually P1 because there's no um, lower symmetry from P2 except P1. And then it's going to check for systematic absences to see if you have a screw axis, right? So if for P2, uh, it could be P21. And so therefore, at every, uh, uh, I think every even you should have um, a reflection if the um, if it's at the, the reflections there, and you can see as you go along here in the indexing, right? It's it's it'll only show you indexes here that uh, have that it has observed. So you might come down on these index and it might skip a number because it doesn't actually observe that. So if you didn't collect enough data, if your data is not complete, it's possible that you won't see an index here because it just didn't get observed. The other thing it's gonna do is it's going from low resolution up to higher resolution. You're more likely to see your systematic absence or if they're not, at, but the presence at low resolution, then you're at high resolution. And if um, for Catherine, who's used to um, scale pack, right, this is the same thing that you get in the, um, when, you're, when you're checking for absences in scale pack. So this is, the, they just not, they're not, it's not, um, because there's only one screw axis here, they only, the index is only for the screw axis. They're not showing you, um, I don't know how to say this, but like like if if you're like in P, uh, a different one here, let me change here. So this is, if you're in one where the screw axis occurs on like H instead of um, like in the last position, then the log, which I've now lost, this is only going to show you it on the axis that would have the screw. I'm mangling this. Okay. So it goes through, it checks all this, but the big thing here is you really only care about this table right here. So um, it says, I've gone through and checked all this. I see one screw axis here. Uh, it has a really strong peat height, so the screw axis is present. So it basically does the checks, it shows you the raw data, and then it makes a summary for you. And so this is what you really care about to see that your stuff is done correctly. Also provides uh, re-index operators in case you want to put it into a different um, space group. So we don't think it's P21, we want to put it into P1, then we could re-index with this. And there's a keyword where you can just use re-index. You don't actually have to give it the matrix to do this, which is, I think, awesome. I hated figuring that out. And, um, and it gives you rankings, right? So uh, if, if you don't change it at all, it this one, you know, the, the, the systematic absences, it's very confident. Uh, the Lauer group, it's not as confident. Um, like completely confident would be like one. So that's why the number um, 0 0.953 for systematic absences is very high, but the Lauer group probability of it being P2 um, is, is a little bit lower. Is there are issues with this data as we have already discussed. Um, but you know that it gives you its confidence and then it will default put it into this space group for you so then and it converts it at this time to an mtc file so
that's like the basic thing of point list. You put it in and it tells you if you have the right space group. Um, the, you can also use this to put it in a space group with screw axes when some of them have not been observed. So for people who have, uh, if you have screw axes, but they're not observed, and then when you are scaling it, it thinks that it's only uh, in, let's say, um, if you're like an orthorhombic, uh, and it's you're actually in P2121, but it indexes and it says it's in P222 because uh, it just doesn't see some of the systematic absences. You can use pointless to put it in there before you go on to additional um, like scaling. You can also do this at the correct step in XDS, but uh, usually it's if you don't want to have to re index all your data in case you have to change space groups, it's better to leave your data um, in the XDS HKL alone and just use pointless to re index it. So that's, um, and it gives you. When it makes the MTZ file, it tells you what column labels applies to your columns, and it tells you what your column types are. And I am going to now segue into just talking about the MTZ file format before I talk about other um, things you can do with your data, because uh, I think that this is very confusing for people who are new to crystallography. So the MTZ file format, uh, we came up with it, and this is basically how uh, we tried to make it so that, or at some point, uh, there was a consensus in the community that we should have our data in a similar format that could go into lots of different programs and be usable. Um, MTZ formats, what Bazer uses, uh, it's what Phoenix uses, and so, uh, I just, you know, I don't think people really understand what they're looking at with it. And so uh, it's, it's, it's documented on the CCP4 website. Uh, and I'm just, I've just come over here. So in this output right here, you can see the column labels are HKL, MISIM, the batch number, I, SIG I, um, the, the fraction calculate, XDET, X rotation detector, Y rotation detector. Um, I don't remember what ROT is, and um, I don't remember what LP and flag are, but they tell you what the column types are here. So H, H, H for the HKL. If you come over here, you can see that H is for a column type that is part of your index. So this is your reflection index when your reflections are indexed. Um, you know, for like your 001 reflection, your 002 reflection, that's your HKL right there. Then they have a Y. So Y down here, M, Y, I, SIM is your packed partial um, rejection flag and the symmetry number. Let me define it right there for you. Uh, batch is for a, in a run, it's the image number. You can have multiple batches if you combine multiple files together. So you can see B for the batch. Um, here, it just ends up being the same thing as your image number. But if like I was combining three or four uh, data sets together, then uh, the batch, they would have individual different batches um, for each in each run. Then we have I, which is a J, which is your intensity. That makes a lot of sense, right? You have, and then SIG I, which is a Q, is your standard deviation. So this is how, um, I like to think of it as how much error is in your intensity or how significant is it? And then, um, the R's are just real numbers. So these are numbers that XDS sends along to record some information for you, which you don't have to keep them. 
And we're going to talk about how you can manipulate your MTZ files um, to retain information that you want and carry it from step to step. Okay. So what else? Let me tell you. Okay. Then they have your salt image. So that's all sitting here, right here. So there are other um, types of column labels that are going to show up later. So Azure intensity, um, after you scale, you're going to want to convert your intensities from, from, so you want to convert your eyes to structure factors. And those are usually the Fs. You'll hear people talk about um, your Fs. Those are your structure factors. And there's a bunch of different Fs that will show up. So you can have um, direct converted Fs from eyes. It's usually, they usually show up as F or FP, which is your native F. And then of course, you're gonna have a SIG F, which is the same thing as your SIG I, which is um, your sort of you know, significance of that F. And then uh, you're gonna hear about phi's, and those are phase information. So when you run phaser, you'll see there'll be a phi C because it's a calculated um, phase from the molecular replacement. If you have, uh, if you have like, anomalous data and you use that to calculate, then usually you'll hear people talk about a phase of phi B. And those get the column P type, like, because they're phases. And um, there's their phase information gets carried a lot in a different, a lot of different columns, because you can see there's A's for Hendricks and Lattman coefficients, which I don't know if we'll see that here since no one's doing sad phasing. Um, so, and then finally for phases, uh, one of the uh, column labels that you'll see is a FOM and FOM, which again, a figure mirror. So how good is that phase information? And then um, there's also a column I don't see here but that is used for um, math calculations. And those also end up in your MTZ files. So that will come back later. But this is how your information is moved around out of that long like sort of list that uh, David showed you on Monday. Uh, that was like, you know, this is your indexes and then this is the intensity. They eventually get sorted into these columns and then um, you can actually pick a column to do something with it at each step. Okay, so this all gets written out. And then the end of the file, it's done. So that's like pointless. I ran it manually. It gives me a log file. Then what we like to do after that. So in this in this example, I um, in this example, I did just one file and then I removed some from the batch. And in doing so, um, I probably want to see how complete this data is since I removed some. And I can do that with aimless. Aimless is a is a scaling program, but I don't need to scale it again because I've already scaled it once. With, so the correct step in XDS has scaling in it. And um, let me, I have to open. Let me show you the aimless script that I wrote up to do this. So aimless right here, here's the name of the program. And then I have hkln. So this is the file that I'm reading in. That was the one that's coming out of the pointless. And then I have the file that I'm gonna write out from this, the name, this, and this can be anything. This is, our, this is what you wanna call your file. 
I also make a log file so that I can read it. Um, and I have that again, that cute little sneaky EOF so it can take some uh, keywords in here. Uh, so at any cat, we even if we're collecting native data, we usually move the anomalous on. And the reason for this is that sometimes you will go back and you will say, hey, I, uh, I, I process this, I'm pretty sure it's native, but oh my gosh, surprise, surprise, I bound a metal. And you might want to uh, make an anomalous difference Fourier with that. And so uh, rather than having to basically reprocess all your data, it's already sitting here, you just save it. Um, but you're going to tell the programs to look, you just basically, it sits there in a column and you don't have to tell the program to look at it if you don't want to. And so it's, it's, it's there, but um, it's, it could be silent, but you carry it along. I think of it as possibly saving work for yourself later on. Um, so we just put the anomalous on. Uh, that's just how we like to do it because we don't ever know if something has anomalous or not but we like to pretend that uh, we might want that information at a later date. Then you have, we have scales constant. And this is because in this example that I'm doing, we, we've already scaled it with XDS. I've excluded some frames and I don't need, um, I don't need to scale it against those because all the data was scaled together once. And then, um, so I'm not going to refine it. So this is the keywords for not refining it because um, I've already scaled it. And then um, I don't have to do any scaling refinement cycles. And then I just have a resolution cut off here. And then if I go right here, I can run this just like I did the other one on the command line like this. And let's see. So you can see it just ran at 1538. And I am actually, this one's really long. Let's not go through this. I will open it up in. Mm, why? Okay. So here we go. Again, right at the top, it tells you what well, the arguments that I put into it so we know what commands were sent. And then in Aimless, if you're, you've are you looked at Rapid, you are familiar. Oh, let me make this wider. You're familiar with that table that we have in Rapid, which is basically this table down here at the end, which talks about your R merge for shell and um, in this one, what we care about is that completeness because I cut out around like 100 frames. And so it's still pretty complete. So here it is in the last resolution shell and overall it's 95% complete. So removing that bit of data didn't um, change my completeness very much. So since the data is pretty complete, we could go back and we could look at other information in this that we care about. So this is very similar to um, aimless basically makes tables very similar to the tables that you saw in the correct.lp. It'll take resolution. It'll tell you how complete it is per by resolution. Uh, is this my this is my analysis for intensity. What's it? This right here is analysis versus a resolution for like R merge, R PIM statistics right here. Um, there's lots and lots of tables here. So this down here at the bottom is a summary of all the tables above. Now, if I had I've got to find. So that's one example where I basically used pointless to remove some files. But if I wanted to do that again with pointless, that's not the file. This one. 
And I'm just going to do this so I can more easily. Just copy and paste this in. So now I am like going to go through and I'm going to put two files together just to show you. If I did this, so this is a different way. So this would be like, let's say you collected two different data sets um, in the example data that we're showing here. Uh, you can process the whole thing, the, the whole run, even though there was a partial roll off because it was still uh, diffraction spots on the section that's being cut out. But in some cases, it's sometimes not possible to process through blank frames. XCS won't do it because either I have too many blank, like, or they're like too blank. There are no spots on it whatsoever. And then you want to process them separately as two uh, separate wedges or three wedges or four wedges, however many wedges. And so in this scenario, so I took out that exclude batch and I'm going to process these two together. And I'm just going to call this manual to um, save it. And then I'm going to run pointless again. And thankfully, it's pretty fast. So you can see that here I have two new files. So this is from this one, and then this is the previous one. And if I look at the log file, it has, I read two different files in. If I can find the right place for you. So it reads the two different files and their headers in. I can show you where the batching is different. So it considers them like two separate data sets. Um, it checks the indexing of both of them to put them in the same um, indexing so that they can be read in together. Here we go. Here's run one, it's batches one through 460, and run two is batches 570 through 600. And there's a gap. Um, you can do things like add numbers to your batches if they use the same numbers, if it's like two sets and they both have images like one through 300. Um, those are all in the keywords. And then it's gonna go through just like before, look at our resolution, and then it's gonna go through and determine the space group again. And you can see that my likelihood numbers have gone up because I tossed that bit. Or if you want to think about it, also like the P1 is much less likely and the P2 is far more likely because I tossed those bad images. And so these are, this is all the same as before. All right, and it reads it out, writes the files. And now we can go to um, actually, I want to do it this way. So I want to, I'm going to copy. Then I'm going to edit it. So 
So in this one, now that we put two of them together, uh, manual two dot mzc hkl. Just rename this stuff so I don't overwrite my previous files. And then I no longer want to do this, these steps right here, because I am, I have two independently scaled wedges that I have merged together with pointless. And now I want to basically give it another round of scaling after I used pointless to put them together. So I'm just going to delete those and take the defaults, which means it's going to scale. Leave the resolution cut off. It's going to run. Again, close my Emacs. Okay, here we go. And you can, the differences here from the previous one is that in this one, I have two runs. So it's going to do these separately, the corrections. And it's going to give me all kinds of error messages. Let me see if I can. So it's it takes the run, it calculates their correlation between, because there's two sets to say, like, are they correlated? And then um, this is not as good as just excluding them, mostly because that, that second wedge is really small. And you can see that with all those error messages that it gave me here, we're saying um, this change is all too small. It basically failed to calculate uh, Rs properly for everything. So it merges them, you're merging statistics. So in truth, for this one, this is probably not the best way to do it. It's just, it's a different way of merging files. Lots of options. Analysis versus batch. So um, you can really tell that it had problems like here in that last bit that I cut off and then tried to put back based on the numbers right there. But it tries, but see all these like, so then um, there's probably was some, even though I cut it, uh, the resolution is probably not as high in those last wedges because you can see that uh, it has much more trouble. I don't know if I can um, say. I'm just going to see if I can show you the two of them side by side. No, I didn't pull back far enough. Um, trying to see if I can scroll back far enough to see all this so here. This is completeness and multiplicity by, which is the same thing. 
here. So the other one is it going to have this because this is it comparing. Um, actually, no. This is a comparing it across runs. See, cumulative CC one half analyzed by batch for each data set, but we only have one bat light because it's summer. It, it was cutting it out. It doesn't have that. I just want to show you. Oh, it's so sad. Really didn't enjoy this. Completeness and multiplicity. I just want to show you the same. Um, here we go. So here it is doing completeness and multiplicity again. And you can see that. So like just comparing right here at 3.14, this one is finding 10,000 with a 95% completeness. And then here it's only finding 8,000. It had all those errors and it's only um, 90, 2% uh, complete. So that's where you're, you can see that it didn't, it didn't like taking a huge wedge and a small wedge and putting it together. You can do it, but your statistics clearly tell you that that was not the way to do it to get the most data out of this. And then rescaling them together. If these horrible, like crazy wackadoodle numbers didn't say that in the first place. So, the reason to use pointless to put wedges, it's not a great example that I've just showed you, but sometimes people have to collect small wedges on many, many crystals in order to make a complete data set. And you can use, instead of scaling all the data together, like data set to data set, and then putting together, you can use pointless to put them all together and then scale it as one. Um, Let's see. So Catherine asked, if you didn't have a case where you were merging data excluding frames, would you still run pointless and aimless or just XDS? So I always run pointless to double check um, my space group before I run aimless. And pointless is my program of choice for converting from XDS.HKL uh, format uh, to MTZ because it automatically does the space group check uh, when it does that. And I think it's more reliable. So uh, you can in say aimless, say take that XDS ASCII data. Um, so usually for aimless, you can't actually take that directly into aimless. It has to be converted. You can use a different point program besides pointless to do that. They, people have widgets for doing it. Um, but they don't all necessarily check your space group. Um, you can uh, you can use other programs like Aimless to convert from MTZ back to SCA if you want to use it for stuff after it's been scaled. But the space group check is what is most powerful about Pointless, and. That's why I always I use I always use it to do the conversion. So there is a, I know this is seemingly silly, but there is a keyword on this. Well, not a keyword, but like a command line option, which is basically copying. So you can, um, so right here, you can just copy and convert without checking but i almost always uh, like to use it and check to make sure that you're in the right space group so once you've done this so let me i am gonna um come back to the ccp4 um setup right here let me see i have so in ccp4 they will take a bunch of the programs that you need and they'll just combine, they like string them all together. So when you come into one, then it will basically do all the steps. So like in this one, it will do pointless, aimless and truncate. And what truncate does is, so I said right here, like it puts out your data. And so at the end of this, 
let me quit right here. Um, at the end of this, uh, you get out of aimless, you're still with intensities. So if you do, um, I wanted to look at it and I wanted to look at this file. I can dump it, command line here. We can look at it and you can see that I have column labels, HKL, I mean, SIG, I mean, and then remember I had the anomalous on on that first one. So they're sitting here like that. And then I have the column types right underneath it, but they're all still intensities. To phaser um, wants structure factors when you do this. Now you can give it a SCA file and it will convert it. Um, if you use Phoenix dot um, their MR, like if you use phaser through Phoenix, uh, it will also run a conversion step as part of the script, but it really, it really wants structure factors when you do this. Um, you can use it to convert. But those conversions do not necessarily always do all the checks for um, your reflections. So one of the things that Truncate does is it not only converts your structure factors, but it um, it's going to make the Wilson plot, which will tell you things like, uh, you know, how, like, are your reflections related to each other in ways that would suggest stuff like twinning and, and um, other aspects. So if you stay in the CCP4 suite and use phaser out of this, you have to, it, it actually, it wants you basically to convert it um, using C truncate two structure factors. And so they fit, chain it all together. And in this step, you can base, you can also add a um, free reflection column. Uh, Phoenix will add it for you. You can basically say, I have no free Rs and then add it in. But you basically always have to set aside some of your data as um, free reflections to control for bias. And so the default is 5%. Um, if you need to be really strict, you can do 10%. And you can do things like uh, extending your data to higher resolution. And this is done um, actually with the whole suite of different programs uh, called um, Truncate and CAD, where base, you, you, you can take columns of data from one MTZ file and you add just the columns you want to another MTZ file. And so in here, so you can see here, I've set up this one to take the two different individual um, XTS uh, files that I just showed you. And um, we could do that, but we already know that that's terrible. And so I am actually going to delete one and I am gonna put, uh, the single set of data back in here. So let me Oh, actually, this is I didn't cut the stuff out in this one. I'm make you guys browse through the any cat directory tree here. Okay. Um. Oh no, wait. I don't want these. Oh yeah, I do. Um. Here, let me. See, I'm changing my mind as I'm doing these things.
because I can do this here. So I can select the whole thing. I can basically say I want to exclude um, the crappy range. I can tell it. So with this one, I'm going to say option to skip scaling and just merge them. I'm not going to scale. Uh, I'm going to run C truncate after this to convert my eyes into structure factors. Um, when it does this, actually, my eyes will go away. If I wanted to keep just the, uh, if I wanted to keep my intensities, I could run truncate by itself. So that would be like here. If I've done that, you can see like it's pulling in the uh, intensities positive and the negative, it's going to write out this file. Um, I could add a label on this. The reason you would want to add an identifier to your column labels is if you were going to add, uh, combine, say, multiple data sets. Let's say you have a native, and then you have an anomalous, and you want to put it all together. So you might have, um, you want to, you might want to have this, like, you add, if you wanted to add native, you could just append nat to all of them, like so. And then you would know this is like a native on the column labels. And the column labels are this is the column labels right here. So if I had appended nat to this, it would be like I mean underscore nat, sig mean underscore nat. So there's just ways for you to keep in mind for yourself uh, what your stuff means. So you can see here's what it's writing out. And uh, if you ever wondered, um, Dano is anomalous. So it basically, instead of separating it out into I plus and I minus, it's all the information is together as one merged um, number. And then you can see that it's keeping the positive and negative structure factors, not the positive, but the, um, the anomalous information separate. It's with the F nat plus and the F nat minus. Or if we don't have it, delete it. And then um, you can see right here, now it's all gone. So if I wanted to just convert to structure factors, then I could take it, I could manually decide which columns are going to move forward. And then I can run it. I could also, in this setup, have it do everything for me. And what it does then. So on the first step, it's running pointless with this HKL out, right? I'm reading one file in, an XDS file in, I'm excluding batches. So it's going to run that. Uh, then it's going to run aimless. And then it's running C truncate. You can see right here. So it's adding columns. So the point and click here in the CCP4 interface is just, um, it's writing a script file in the background and running the programs just like I did on the command line, but you know, you don't have to, um, you don't have to do all that typing I did and do all that work. If I wanted to just run um, truncate by itself, I could, I, I set these up um, before class. And then I have somewhere here. There it is. Sorry, these are like so hard to find. Okay, so here's truncate. There's aimless. It's doing its little. Well, not little, but it's doing its stuff. Might take a bit because I set both of them to run, and I only have one processor on this machine. Um. So this is just part of the scripting where um, after it's run thing, it's making a bunch of temporary files so it can add columns together. It's completing reflections. Here it's adding the free R flag. And then um, see it's catting. The, so cat is where I told you you can take columns from one file and you can add and you can make a combined MCZ with all your different data columns. So it's putting adding the free R flag in. 
completing them. And now it's done. You can view the files from the job. I can um, give you some idea here. They make this HCAL viewer. So you can see in this one, um, it, it keeps, it kept all the Fs. All this and it kept all the eyes. I kept them separate. And in this one, because I took the default, it automatically appended XDS data set to this. You can change that. That's just what happened here. And it tells you about um, that, you know, it has all the HKLs and it has a free R flag. And then you can take this on to do future steps. If you look at exit from here so everything doesn't crash. So see here, this is this. So the first one was from that combined huge run of uh, pointless, aimless, and see truncate. And then this right here is the manual one that I did by itself. And you can see since I named it, it doesn't have all the that XDS data set stuck after it, but it's set up similarly if you're your space group tells you what type of mtz file it is so that is um taking your data uh basically giving it a little bit of polish if you need it and then converting it into a format where it's ready to go through other programs for analysis um what i'm planning um so on Monday, uh, I would like it if everyone could process their data with XDS and then take it through pointless, take it through aimless, um, and see truncate and truncate so that you and and add your free R's. And then we're going to look at our data. So things that you will probably want to know about your data, you want to know what your ISA is, you're going to want to know what your CC1 at half is, your highest resolution. And um, you want to um, you want to you want to know if like you want to have taken it through and cut your data if the resolution that you started with is too high. So let's say the edge of your detector was three angstroms and you only have data to four angstroms, then you need to have gone back and either have used um, aimless or used um, an XDS and cut your data to three angstroms. Um, and if you have trouble doing this, we will talk about it on Monday. So um, I'm not expecting everyone to like process it and have like great, amazing data at the end. Uh, in terms of learning purposes, the best thing would be if you guys had lots and lots of problems so we could learn from it. But uh, if not, um, process it, take it through. Uh, if we're stuck, we're gonna discuss it on Monday, uh, but try to have it done before then. I hope this explains <laughs> a little bit about like these, there's a lot of programs here before we even get on to structure solution. Uh, I would like to on the following Wednesday from this, take the data that you've processed and, or if it turns out that, you know, after you've done this on Monday that you have the world's most awful data and, um, you know, uh, Yan or Catherine says that you should not take it on and they would like to give you a different data set to work on, then, on Wednesday, you can switch over to the new data set, which should also be at the same state. It should be at a state where you've added um, free R flags and it, you have both intensities and structure factors in the MTZ. And we're going to take it through some analysis programs uh, next week um, to learn as much about our data set before we begin structure solution. So I uh, have planned for things like X triage um running mole rep to determine if you guys have any non-crystallographic symmetry um and there is 
uh, for next Wednesday, um, there's a paper that I have put up on the, the Google Classroom by Michael Sawaya about um, how to characterize a crystal from an initial native data set that people should uh, at least have skimmed over and be familiar with. 